all the time. That's good. <laughs> Praise God. We're going to continue in righteousness. I'll tell you what, the more I re study about this, the more I, I realize that this is a major part of knowing who we are in Christ. And until we know who we are, we can't flow in the gifts that we're supposed to flow in, like in healings and different things like that. We, we need to know who we are so that we can boldly come to the throne room of grace. Because if you don't know if you're saved from one day to the next or if God's an angry God or if he's not an angry God, if you don't know those things, you're wishy-washy. You're, you're double-minded. You have no clue. Okay? We need to be solid in solid foundation. Okay? We need to be in the, in, know that we're grounded in redemption, that you are saved, that you are sealed, and that you are delivered. Okay? Those are the things that we need to know, and then we can build from there. And as we, we, we find out today, we need to get off the milk and get into the, into the, into the meat. Okay? We need to get off the milk and into the meat. You know, this, this thing of, of getting right with God. Oh, we need to get right. Well, you're already right. You're already right. You know, you didn't make yourself right. When you came to Christ, you became right, okay? God gave you the gift of righteousness. Now it's yours. It's like this ring. You know, if I give this to Jackie, it's all she has to do is take it. Take it. It's yours. Receive it, okay? It's receive it. That's what we need to do is receive and know who we are because a lot of the church, they have no clue who they are. They're still on the milk. They're still on the milk. So let's go to Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5 and I believe it's verse 8 through 14. Hebrews 5, it says, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience. I want, you to, I want you to look at two things here because I added something into this. Okay, yet he learned obedience. Okay, Jesus, talking about Jesus, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Are you learning obedience by the things you suffer through life? Okay, what is obedience? Is it the Ten Commandments? No, it's not that one. We're going to find out. Okay? And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Is that the Ten Commandments? No. Okay, let's, let's go. Okay, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. I want you to go to Romans, Dave, and then come back to the second part of this one. Go to Romans. In Romans, it says this, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness. Are, are you children of God or are you sons of God, sons and daughters? We should be sons and daughters. Okay. Now, I want you to see something here. And declared to be the son of God. Now, Jesus is in you. He is the son of God. But you are also sons and daughters, okay? With power, with power, according to the spirit of holiness, okay? That's how we should be, okay? By the resurrection from the dead, okay? That's exactly, uh, there's, a, there's a point right there. Why would he put by the resurrection of the dead? Because the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead? Well, yes, but you have to realize that when you were, when Jesus was crucified when he laid his life down when he arose again you were also risen with him okay you are now a new creation in Christ all things have passed away all things have become new okay so by the resurrection from the dead so you have to know that you are now a new creation that you are the righteousness through him we have received grace an apostleship for the obedience to the faith. Obedience now in a new covenant is obedience to the faith. Not the Ten Commandments, thou shall not, thou shall do, thou shalt, shouldn't do that, thou shall do this, but don't do that. Don't worry about that. It is now your obedience to the faith. Your obedience to your trusting in God, into the finished work, that he has already accomplished on the cross, okay? So, through him we have received. See now, through him we have received grace. How, how do you receive grace? Through the obedience to the faith. By your trust in his finished work. That's how you receive his favor, is by your obedience to the faith, okay? 
among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Okay, so now we understand that when, let's go back to that, that um, first scripture in Hebrews 5. Okay, so then when he says, yet he learned obedience, obedience to the faith, that's what he's talking about. That's exactly what he's talking about because Jesus experienced it first and then we experience it. You see, he had to go through, this, through the whole situation first so that we could go through it also. So he learned through his sufferings, through the things that you're going through in life, Jesus went through. But it is bringing us to the obedience of the faith, of our trusting on him, in him, on him. Understand? So whenever you see obedience, you need to be obedient to God. It's not talking Ten Commandments now in a new covenant. In the old covenant, yes. But in the new covenant in which we are, and you are a Gentile, we are a new creation, now we are under a new covenant and your obedience lies in your faith in Him. Your trusting in Him. I've said that about 14 times now and I want you to understand it. Because in two weeks I don't want you to go, well, oh, we got to do this. We got to be obedient. You know, we, we shouldn't do that. No, 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 no. Obedient to the faith. Obedient to trusting in Him, in the finished work. Okay? Okay, so now let's go on. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. That's a major, major part right there. Unskilled in the word of righteousness. Most of the church and most people are unskilled in the word of righteousness. Okay? Now we'll go on. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, talk about that. For he is a babe. We talked about this last week. You know, we've heard about people, new Christians that have come to church, have come in, and we say, well, they're babes in Christ. No, they probably know more than you do. Why? Because they're not educated. Okay? They're not educated. And I'm just going to tell a story about a person that said that, you know, we used to see miracles all the time. We used to see all, all these miracles when we first came to Christ. And then we, we had prayer meetings, and we, we started going to church, and, and all, I don't know what's happened, but it's, it's, nothing works anymore. Why? Because you went to church and you got educated. You got educated in the wrong foundation. You've been educated in the wrong foundation. That's why you don't see God moving in your life. Okay? When we get, become educated in the word of righteousness and knowing who you are, you're rooted in the right foundation and you start to see those miracles happening again. Okay? You didn't care when you were first born again. You knew you were a, a, a slug. Okay? But now you're just all happy because you know, it's all been lifted. But then, then we, have, we get into this works thing. Well, now, now it's great that you're born again, but now, now, need, now you need to learn something. Okay, you can just you can you can reminisce, go back into the churches that you've been. Now that you've been saved, now we need to you need to know some things. You know, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. You know, um, all this stuff. You know, thou shalt not do, thou shalt do, and you need to do this, and you need to be praying. And, and granted, yes, we do, we should pray, but when it becomes a work, it's dead works. It's dead works because you're trying to do something to earn your salvation. That's what dead works is. Okay, but solid. Food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. We talked about this last week. What God is talking about, now that you've been born again, now that you know that who you are in Christ, you can now experience life. What's good for you, Daryl? What's good for you, Dave? What's good for Dave may not be good for Daryl, and vice versa. Okay? What's good for you? You know, staying up till 4 o'clock in the morning and trying to get up at 7, that's probably not too good, you know. That's, oh, I get sleepy, <laughs> you know. Okay, so you experience life. Experience life. Live life. Live it and experience. And, and you can determine what is good for you and what isn't good for you. It's not about what's, oh, that's, it's not about good and evil, okay. It's not about, that's, you're, that's gonna, you know, that's good, okay, you're heading for heaven. Oh, that's bad, you're heading for hell. No, that's not about that. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with you experiencing life, okay? You, you, it, it's your walk. It's your walk with God. Experience life. But, but experience it with Jesus, okay? Experience it with, with Jesus. Okay, so it doesn't say that, that people are unskilled in the word of God. It says that they are unskilled in the word of righteousness, Okay? 
they, 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 can be, they can be really knowledgeable of the Word of God, know the Scriptures, know all this stuff, but yet they're still living in a, in a life that is a, full of works. Okay? Knowing not if they are right with God. Knowing if they are not, maybe God's angry at me today. Man, I swore at this guy today. Maybe, maybe God's angry at me. God's never angry at you anymore. Anger is gone. He took it all out on Jesus. Okay? Yeah. John Edwards. Yeah. 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 The, the example of John Edwards last week that I talked about. It was, I think it was in the 1900s, early 1900s, wasn't it? It was. But he, anyway, he had, he had, it was the, it was the, uh, it was the sinners in the hand. He had this message and it was, it was called the awakening to America to come to Christ. And the name of this message was, was sinners in the hand of an angry God. Okay? Well, that, what that does, and I've been in churches like this, where they try to scare you into heaven. You know, they scare you into heaven. Oh my gosh, I'm going to hell. They, scare, they try to scare you in. Okay, well that's fear. You're driven by fear. Okay, that's not love. You know, well God is love. Well then how, if God is love, how come he's angry at me all the time? Okay, he's not. He's not. He doesn't do that. So, but John... Edwards was a very educated man. He was, the, the, he was, he was a, a dean at Princeton College, okay? He was the a big to-do, okay? Smart. He went to college at the age of 13. So he was very smart, but very uneducated and unskilled in the word of righteousness. Very uneducated. A lot of the preachers today on TV, you, see, you turn on TBN and you'll see, oh, oh, brother, Don, now I tell you. Oh, I feel it. If you just give, oh, oh, I feel it. If you just give a hundred dollars, oh, and there's somebody out there going to give. If they just give a thousand dollars, if they just give that, oh, then we're going to send you this prayer cloth, and you're going to receive God's anointing. So what are you doing? You're having to purchase something. You have to do something to get something. That is so phony. That is just one big phony circus show. That's all it is. Talk about a scam. And I can see why people say, well, they're just after your money. That's what they are. They got this, you know, $5,000 suit on and, oh, you know, it's a scam. Sorry, but it is. You don't have to do anything to get something. Jesus already did it. And it's all you have to do is receive it. Okay? So, they're unskilled in the word of righteousness. Now, we went through um, obedience. We know what obedience means. So what is righteousness? What is righteousness? Did we go through what obedience was? Yeah, we did, didn't we? But righteousness is, Jesus is our, this is the Hebrew meaning of righteousness. You are right with God, but Jesus, our refuge, which hopes are directed, is the door. So Jesus is the door, okay? He's the door that we walk through, that we have to go through. Draw from him so that his might and powerful hand will remove the veil of blindness and connect you to the cross. Now, I find this very interesting because a leaf is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. A leaf, okay? Now, when the Hebrews, when Moses went up to the mountain and the second time, or the first time, to get the, get the commandments, he came down and he saw that the, the, the Israelites had made a golden calf, right? And he's the first one that broke all the commandments because he broke them. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> okay, so God had to do it again. Okay? <laughs> so, but anyway, what, is, what does the golden calf represent? Gold represents righteousness. Anytime you see gold, it represents righteousness. And the calf is works because works is what? they were working for their righteousness. Okay, so that's what a golden calf represents, working for your righteousness. Now, a leaf is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it means the sacrificial ox. Okay, the sacrificial ox. So, and it means he is the ox. Okay, he is righteous. He is doing the work for you. Not you doing the work for righteousness. 
but he did the work so that you can become righteous. You see? Do you see something there? Is it just me? I see some... <laughs> <laughs> the sacrificial ox. He has done all the work for you so that his might and powerful hand will remove the veil of blindness and connect you to the cross. That's where it's all at, is at the cross. Okay? But people have turned it all around. People have turned, the church have turned it around. God is saying, you're right with me. God is saying, you're right with me. But the church is saying, how do I get right with you? How do I get right with you, Lord? How do I do that? How do I get right? What do I have to do, Lord, to get right with you? Oh, what do I have to do? If you'll just give that thousand dollars. You see? What a, what a bunch of baloney, okay? So there's totally wrong foundation. God is the one who declares righteousness, okay? He told Abraham he was righteous. Abraham didn't say he was righteous, you know? If I told Lizzie that she's righteous, she'd go, ha! <laughs> right. If I told Becky she was righteous, she goes, yeah. <laughs> No, but Abraham didn't say he was righteous. God said that he was righteous. So Abraham didn't go upon his feelings and what he thought from day to day. He just knew, he just believed God for what he said. If God said it, I believe it. That's good enough for me, you know? That's, that's all there is to it. So, let's go back to Hebrews five thirteen through 14. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses, senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So we talked about that. We said, you know, it's, it's up to you to experience life. But we've made it into what is right and what is wrong. Well, like I say, what's right and wrong differs between people. So, so that's why grace is so spooky for a lot of people. Grace is spooky to people because they, a lot of people, they have to have this rigid formula. I've got to have this formula written out, and I've got to, I can do this, I can do this. Okay, I can't do that. Okay, I can do this, but I can't do that. You see, it's, grace is something that people look at and they go, well, that, if you believe in grace, you're thinking that it's too good to be true. You can just do whatever you want, and, and it just you can sin, and it's okay. No. Because what scriptures did we talk about that tells us different about grace? I didn't ask you, Dave. <laughs> Titus 2.11 says that grace leads us to live a godly life. So when we start to understand grace, those desires Start, those old desires go away. Okay, it's not something that's, that's modified. We don't have to modify our behavior. As in, as in um, the, the sacrifices they did in the Old Testament. Okay, they, they had a sin offering. They had, they had things that would cover your sin for a year. But it was just external. It didn't deal with the heart. Okay, but now we're under a new covenant where our conscience is cleansed. It's purged. You know, and so... <laughs> It's, it deals with our heart. It cleanses and purifies our heart. So, grace is God in you, dealing with you moment by moment, representative of Adam walking with God in the garden. Okay? He walked with him in the garden every day. But now, he's in us. He walks with us every moment of the day. Every moment of the day, he's there. If we need him, we just reach out. We call out to him, and we need him every day. So, what is the milk? What is the milk? The milk, then, of the word is people who aren't accustomed to righteousness, that they're right with God. And like I said last week, how many, how many times have you heard a service said, we need to get right? Don, I know you've heard it. I've heard it. We need to get right. We've, been in this, we've walked the same paths. We need to get right before God, you know. I heard it yesterday. I heard it yesterday from someone. Oh, we need to get right. We need to get right. I didn't say nothing. I didn't say a word because it doesn't do no good 
that someone that is so blinded, I'm not going to change them by what I say. I, I, by what I tell them, if they are rooted in their heart, in their belief, if they believe that, if you get into somebody, to someone that is embedded in the law, and you know, you, you know within just seconds if they are, it doesn't do you any good to argue with them because it will just make them mad. You know, it will. It'll just make them angry. The best thing to do for them is to pray for them. Just pray for them. Lord, I ask that you would open their eyes to your grace. Lord, open their eyes that they can see your grace and your love and that your love for them. Okay? Because, like I say, I've been in those battles before and it goes absolutely nowhere because they built this wall up and I've preached in places like that. When you start preaching grace, bless me. You can't bless me. You're not going to tell me that. I've been learned. I've been taught. I've been learned that many years ago. <laughs> you see, and they're so embedded in it that they have. They don't have an open mind. Have an open mind to hear what someone has to say. Then look at it through the eyes of grace. If Steve comes to me and says, "Well, now." I don't agree with that totally, Vic. I, I see it this way. Well, okay, I'm going to be open-minded, and I'm going to look at it and go, okay, am I missing something here? I need to research this. I need to study this out. I need to see how this is through the eyes of grace. And if I go, oh, I, I can see where you're coming from on that. Okay, I, I understand that. You know, Does it line up with the Word of God? Does it, but, but be open-minded. But, but to law... When, everyone, when anyone puts a demand on you, if there's a demand placed upon you, shut it out immediately because it's law. Run as fast as you can. Get out. Okay? Because it's placing it upon works. So, righteousness is the foundation for you to grow. Okay, now, this is, I, I, I want to go into Hebrews 6, 1 through 6. This is very, people will look at this and they'll say, once you've fallen away, you can't be saved again. Okay, I've heard this before. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Okay, you have to repent. Okay, you just have to always repent. Dead works is trying to do something. Dead works is trying to do something to earn your salvation. That's what dead works is. Okay? I'm trying to do something. We're going to open a food pantry. We're going to open a, a clothes pantry. We're going, to, we're going to do this. We're going to go out and we're going to minister. We're going to, we're going to, and God's going to see what I've done. You see, God's going to see all the things that I've done for him. Well, what am I doing? Wrong motive. You know, oh, God's going to see how beautiful the music was. What am I doing? Wrong motive. You see, I'm trying to earn my salvation. That's not it. That, that's dead works, okay? So, from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Now, the doctrine of baptisms, I want to tell you something about that. We've all been taught that you, that you could be baptized, right? That is law. That is law. Because in the Old Testament, what did you have to do to become saved? Anybody. Believe and be baptized. Okay. Now, the law says that you must be baptized. Okay. In the New Testament, in the New Covenant, does it say anywhere that you have to be baptized? No. If you want to be baptized, I'm not saying don't get baptized, but if you want to get baptized, go ahead. I'm not against that. I'm not, but, but it is ceremonial. It is a ceremony. It is something of the old covenant that has been drug into the new and has become our religion. Okay? And it's not any part of the New Covenant. Anywhere. Do I see that? Anywhere. If you see it somewhere, show me. I don't see it. Okay? I don't see it. So, baptisms, that's why it says doctrine of baptisms. The old, the babe, the, 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 the milk. Okay? That's what he's talking about. Okay? Of laying on of hands of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is, now here's the part right here. We're going to discuss this a little bit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. 
and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, okay, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance. Oh, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. So people that don't know the word, they, they look at it like this. Oh, well, see now, once they've tasted the good news, what, it's impossible for those who have been enlightened. And enlightened, Dave looked this up in the Greek. What did it mean, Dave? Uh, once and for all. Once and for all. Okay, so that would be what? Once and for all would be, mean more like eternal, wouldn't it? Eternally. So, for, it is impossible for those who have been saved if they fall away to renew them again to repentance. That's a noodle scratcher. Okay? <laughs> okay, so what does it mean? Does it say anything about renew them unto salvation? No. It says repentance. It is impossible to renew them unto repentance. Okay, so what does repentance mean? Let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah 30, 15, I believe it is. It says, For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning, this is what, this is what repentance means in Hebrew. Okay? It means in returning and rest you shall be saved. Okay, so now, what, what does it mean? It is impossible for those who have been enlightened. It is impossible for those who have rested in God. Okay? It's impossible for those who, if they've, they've come to find out, okay, what I need to do is I need to trust in Him. I need to rest in Him. Now, if I fall away, in other words, I slide back into, into dead works, it's impossible for me to be renewed unto repentance. It's impossible for me, if I fall away into dead works, it is impossible for me to rest you see, if I fall back into dead works, it is impossible for me to rest. Think of those that you know who are in the law. Do they rest? Do they have rest? They're always in turmoil. Okay? They're always working. So it is impossible them, for them to come back. It doesn't say about they're going to hell. They're, they're, it doesn't say that. It says once they've been enlightened, once they're saved, you're saved. Now, if you fall away... It's impossible to bring them back unto repentance. Repentance can also mean a changed heart. So until they change their heart, they cannot enter into that rest again. Do you see what I'm saying? So this is not a scripture of about, because I've had people bring this up to me. Well, that means, you know, if you fall away, you're going to hell. Have you heard that, Don? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like I say, we've traveled the same paths, okay? So, it doesn't, that's not what it's saying. It is saying that once you've been enlightened, once you're saved, man, what's, what, what part of eternal is um, not forever? It, you're, you're saved, right? You're saved. So, this answered a question to me because I know so many people I'm just going to talk about your grandma for a second. They were in law, but I know she's went to heaven because at the very end, she was in her bed and she started going like this. She started pointing up at the ceiling. And she was weak. And she grabbed a hold of my arm and she come up out of that bed. And I mean, she was like Hulk Hogan, you know? I'm going to go, man. I got to go. I'm going to heaven. They're coming after me now. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Snap into a Slim Jim. <laughs> okay. So what she did, her eyes were opened to the heavens. She was pointing up at them. Her aunt said, don't miss it. Whatever you do, don't miss it. So what happened? She come up out of bed and she was into work. <laughs> she, was gonna, she was trucking on to heaven. She didn't know where she was going, but they hauled her back and put her in heaven. 
or put her in heaven. They put her in bed. <laughs> Got it wrong, see? <laughs> they put her back into bed, and I mean, she just went. She went away. Okay, her spirit went. So that tells me that once enlightened, just like the story about the people that said they had seen so many miracles, okay, and then they got educated and they know nothing now, you know? They think they do, but they're ignorant. <laughs> they're ignorant in the ways of righteousness. But that doesn't mean they're going to hell. Doesn't mean they're going to hell. It means that until they enter into that rest again, they can't, enter, they, they can't, they can't come back until, into that rest. They can't get the fullness of Christ until they come into that rest. Okay? That's where it's at. So that gave me, that scripture kind of gave me some hope. Because I, I always question, well then, if you don't know grace, you're going to hell. Well, I don't, I don't believe that. Okay? I, I don't think so. It's, I don't want to I don't want to know grace and then fall back okay because I think that's very scary I think you'll get in by the by the by the your tail feathers being singed you know what I'm saying <laughs> I don't want that but I want to walk in the fullness of Christ what you don't learn here you're going to learn up there what you don't get here you're going to get up there okay so those people I know for a fact that she's in heaven because she, she went with such peace. And other people that are still indoctrinated in law, does it mean they're going to hell? I'm not the judge. I'm not the judge. But I know that they're saved. I know they love Jesus. You know, I know they love Jesus. Now, whether they love him the way we do or how they look at him and the way we do, we're splitting hairs. But I do know one thing. I do know that we can walk in God's fullness with His grace. That's where I want to be. I'm not the judge of those people. You know, I just know that love is where it's at. Okay? Love is where it's at. So, repentance is only one meaning. So, the Hebrew meaning of repentance is like what we saw just right there. Now, let's go to Hebrews 5, 9 and 10. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. We are what? Kings and priests. We are kings and priests. Okay? As Jesus was called by God as high priest, we are now kings and priests. Okay? According to the order of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek was nothing but blessings. He put out nothing but blessings. There was no curses involved in that. Okay, the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so in other words, we can look at it and we don't have to worry about curses. So all we have to think about is, thank you, Lord, for those blessings. I receive them. I receive them. Know who you are. Okay, so let's go to Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7 says this, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. So Melchizedek means king of righteousness and king of peace. This is what Jesus is the high priest of. He's the high priest of, of righteousness and peace, resting in him. See, we are to rest in him. We, are, we know that we are righteous. We are the righteousness of God. So we can rest in him, okay? Right with God. I know I'm right with God, and I'm at peace with God. I'm not dealing with an angry God, okay? I know that God is not angry at me. I know that he is at peace with me. I know that I'm the righteousness of him because he's given me righteousness. He's called me righteous. So I am righteous, not by how I feel, but by what he says. Okay? So, in Hebrews 8, in Hebrews 8, it says, but, excuse me, yeah, Hebrews 8. But now, he has ordained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also a mediator of a better covenant, 
which was established on better promises. Now he's talking about the new covenant in which we're living. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. So we found there, God found fault in the first covenant. Okay? So if there's fault in the first covenant, why does the church want to keep lingering in that first covenant? Because there's fault in it. Okay? So, because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant and disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none of them his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that, he says, a new covenant. He has made the first, in a, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Okay, so now, are you under the old covenant? Okay, now, he says, go to back to the scripture above that, the slide above it. Okay, he says, um, for this new covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. Okay, but in the scripture before that, we saw that there was fault in the old covenant. Correct? He found fault with the old covenant. So why would God put his laws that he found fault with on your heart. If there's fault in it, why would he write them on your heart? He wouldn't. So he is not talking the Ten Commandments there. Those aren't the laws that he's talking about at all. Okay, so we, we need to understand who, who the writer of this book, and I, 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 I believe it's Paul. I can't prove that. Nobody knows for sure, but I, just his style of writing, I, I would think it is Paul. But he's saying, the writer of this, of Hebrews, he is, he is speaking to Hebrews, okay? People who are struggling with this grace thing. They're struggling with it. So they've been doctrinized for thousands of years. You've been doctrinized for 30, 40 years in law. So it's difficult for us to grab this grace thing. It's hard. It is to understand it because we've been told something and we have to delete the program and reboot it, you see? <laughs> and we need, to, we need to rebuild it. We have to rebuild that foundation. So it's, it's hard for us to, and, it, it, and it's easy for you to look at me kind of with a weird face because you're, gonna, you're questioning it, and that's okay. I'm glad you're questioning it because you need to question what I'm telling you, and you need to go study it, and you'll find out. Don't just believe what I'm telling you. You study it. You study it out. This is what God has given me. You study it. Maybe God gives you something different, but I'm thinking we're going to run along the same lines here, okay, when you actually study it. So, what does the law mean? Let's go to the next slide. The meaning of, of writing laws, I put this on Facebook a while back. It's Hebrews 8.10. I will put my laws in their mind, and I'll write them on their hearts. If you're not on Facebook, get on it, because I put a message on there every day, okay? You can read it. If you don't, if you don't have Facebook and you've got an email, I can email it to you, too, Okay? What laws was God referring to when he said, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts? He was certainly not referring to the Ten Commandments known as the laws of the Old Covenant since he said that he found fault with that covenant and declared it obsolete. Okay, let's go ahead. The laws that God puts in your minds and writes on your heart refer to the royal law of love. Of love. 1 John 4, 10 through uh, 19. The perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. And the law of faith, Romans 3.27. These are the laws of the new covenant. You live according to the laws of the new covenant when you are conscious of how much God loves you. And the more you are conscious of his love for you, the more your heart is filled with his love. It's not about loving, you, loving God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. You can't. But when you understand how he loves you, then you can begin to love God 
the way he wants to be loved. And you can begin to love your spouse. And you can be, begin to love Don. I mean, that's difficult. <laughs> just ask Becky. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but when we understand his love, then we can start to love like he loves. Okay. Uh, and the more you are conscious of his love for you, the more your heart is filled with love. When that happens, you will love God and the people around you supernaturally and effortlessly. That is God writing on your heart the royal law of love, that we love because he first loved us. Secondly, when, we, when you know that you are per perfectly accepted by God because of Jesus' sacrifice, you're right with God, okay? You can have the courage and liberty as a child of God to come boldly into the presence of your heavenly Father, okay? And in his presence, he is able to write on your heart new desires. You will find yourself wanting to do the right thing at the right time. You will live life victoriously from the inside out. This is the perfect law of liberty operating in your life. Thirdly, when you sense what God is writing on your heart and putting in your mind, and as your faith is activated, causing you to trust, okay, your faith is activated by trusting him, him and his love for you, he calls it obeying the law of faith. When that happens, whatever you believe, you receive. God has made it easy, and you will find that is exciting. You live life under the new covenant. You will live according to the laws of the new covenant when you are righteous conscious, not sin conscious, and conscious of the love that God has for you. Praise God. That is, that is awesome. And I think I'm going to end right there. I'm going to end right there. I got one more, one more Sunday of this. And then we're going to go into the basics of why we had a new covenant. And, and the, one of the reasons why we have a new covenant is you just read it. Because God found fault with the old. Okay? And it deals with your heart. You can come up.